All right, welcome to We Fight Monsters. Today, I've got a great guest, guest uh, Jeff Struker. Uh, very exciting for me, man. My heart is just beating out of my chest because uh, he's one of my heroes. Jeff, how are you, man? I'm great, man. It's good to be with you, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, um, you are probably, I've seen so many YouTube videos. I've, I've seen a lot of guys in the uh, different communities. <clears throat> I think yours, the convocation that you did at Liberty University is probably the most articulate you spoke so succinctly, so clearly, uh, with such a reverence for God, and uh, blew me away. Uh, it was very profound, poignant. I, I almost cried, but I was trying to process how 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 the experience that you were trying to convey to the audience. It, it was uh, very moving. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, that was so long ago, and. I'm amazed. I continue to have people tell me, hey, I found this video on YouTube of you at Liberty University. Um, this was almost 20 years ago. Yeah, it, it blew me away. <clears throat> and and what it was, was um, there was that moment we'll talk about. There's that section in the movie where, you know, you're going to that kill zone where everybody's firing at you guys. And but you had come back and, and we'll get more into it. And I, it comes to mind, Philippians 4, 6, 7, which is, you know, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, be prayer by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God. And so I thought about that and there was that moment we were speaking to God, but let, let's, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's talk about that. This was a, a life changing moment for you. And so I'm not going to get into what happened. You, you, you the readers, the viewers, everybody that can research that. Um, I want to spend this time really talking about you and your transformation and, and how you're helping people. So, You'd already been in Pan in Panama, and you've already been in some other operations. So, when you got into Somalia, what were you thinking? Just another, yeah, you know, operation. Two things um, that I try to point out, especially to people that are not familiar with the military. The first is what you just said. I've already been to combat before going to Somalia, so it's not my first rodeo. Um, both both of my combat tours before Somalia were with the Ranger Regiment, and I've been shot at. I know what that feels like. And the second thing that I point out to audiences is, is that I was a very, very sincerely committed Christian before I joined the army. So I had this rock solid faith that I brought with me uh, in Somalia. And I don't think I would have been prepared. Man, I've, I've been shot at before, like I said, but nothing like I experienced in Somalia. All those tours in Iraq or Afghanistan, none of them came close to Somalia. It was just uh, the intensity of the fight was unlike anything I've ever experienced. And if it wasn't for a little bit of experience and a little bit of combat before that, and my more, more importantly, my rock solid faith, I don't know that I would have been able to fight my way through that battle. Um, but I also had some pretty amazing leaders that were all around me during that entire 18 hour firefight. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I was able to lead the way that I did that, uh, that day. How old were you at the time? I mean, you were a team leader. How, how old were you? I was 24 years old, been in the Army okay. since I was 18. So I, I'd been in the Army for about six years. Um, and I had about 10 guys that I was responsible for over there. You know, I, I watched um, uh, Black Hawk Down again. And um, after watching it, and then I watched your video of you speaking uh, at the convocation. And, and again, a couple other videos I was doing some research. Uh, I saw it differently, saw the movie differently. And it was very intense uh, yeah. just because it was contextualized for me through your words. And then I understood the depth of what you guys were going through. And I, I obviously I can't understand something co so complex and powerful like that, but um, it, it was, it was difficult. My, my chest was heaving and I said, this is, um, this is terrible what you guys went through. Um, are you able to watch the movie at all? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I've watched it a lot of times, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, let me say it this way. Everyone wants to know, is the movie accurate? Yes, it's exceptionally accurate, but it's not even close to the real deal, yeah. nor would anybody be able to stomach a movie that was close to the real deal. Um, but when friends of mine watched the movie, they were all saying, Jeff, I, I had no idea that you guys went through this. In fact, um, after the big battle was over with, most of us didn't talk about it because the news portrayed it as something totally different. And then when Mark Bowden finally wrote the book Black Hawk Down and it went to the New York Times bestseller list and just camped there. And then the movie Black Hawk Down came out. People started looking at this event differently. And I, uh, I, I try to explain to friends or to, to people that don't have any experience in the military 
what's hard to understand, the news didn't even do a good job of portraying is you put a couple of hundred guys in the city streets against probably 10 to 12,000 armed Somalis. And for most of that fight, the battle was 10 feet away, point blank range. So you're going to get the kind of results that you got every time. It doesn't matter who you put in there. Um, and uh, I saw incredible uh, feats of valor that day, man. I saw guys on that battlefield do stuff that just blew my mind. No doubt. I mean, uh, I had spoken to Tom Satterley uh, a couple episodes yeah. ago. I'm sure you guys know each other. And uh, he was just recounting uh, that, you know, it was intense. I think he was 26 at the time, just what you guys had done. And I, we can't even understand, you know, even as a veteran myself, it, it, to comprehend that because that was very intense, 18 hours. Um, and you, again, you said hundreds of thousands of people shooting at you as you guys are going through the, the corridors. Uh, and you, you, were, you were in charge of that. But the other thing is you guys are so young, you know, 19, 20, 21, 24. How do you put that all together? So as a mature man now, you can look back. You're probably yeah. in your 50s or 60s you know, or, or late 50s. So how do you put it all together? And do you revisit it from time to time? Does it come to you in dreams or in nightmares? Is it something that you think about or uh, giving yourself all over to Christ? How does it help you process what you went through? Yeah, well, I think about it all the time. There's really not a day that goes by that I don't remember M more the battle and my buddies uh, mm -hmm. and how they did than the, all of the blood around me. I, I don't I don't have those persistent nightmares about the blood, but I think about it almost every day. And I've, I'm now at the point where I, I think about it and I just simply reflect, God, thank you for giving me the privilege of being around warriors like this that were that amazing. Um, I was 24 years old, but I was a pretty experienced 24 year old. Mm -hmm. At this time in the early 1990s, there had been guys in the army for 20, 30 years that have never gone to combat. I'm 24 years old. This is my third rodeo. Uh, right. So I kind of have a framework to process things. Mm -hmm. But to be honest with you, man, when, when the battle was most intense, all of us, every single, I don't know one of us that didn't have the impression I'm going to die. There's no chance of survival. No warrior is going to be able to survive these kind of odds. Um, and the next morning when the dust cleared, I think all of us were looking at each other like, how did that, how, how did it, how is it possible that I just survived that? And most of, most of my buddies came away with the impression like God must have done something to give me a second chance. I think that's where a lot of people uh, a lot of the impression that people came away with for me mm -hmm. it's no exaggeration to say my faith was the foundation that i stood on the whole 18 hour battle like i wouldn't have been able to roll again and again into the streets if it wasn't for my faith no way so you talk about that um you're coming back and it's the first time you come back this is before um uh uh Pillow. What was it? Uh, yeah, pillow when he, when he passed away. But uh, when you came back and you said you were shaking, you were cleaning the blood out of that Humvee and you were shaking so bad. <clears throat> what was going through your mind at that time? I mean, was there some type of scripture that was going through your mind? Uh, how did you appeal to God? Yeah. What was it? I'm a combat leader. And the very first thought was my men. Okay. So I just had one guy killed in action. He was sitting inches away from me. And I was thinking, I just made it back to the base. I got notified. I, it's time for me to turn around and to go back out into the city to get to the crash site where the second Black Hawk went down. And I was thinking as a combat leader, OK, I'm going to get every one of my men killed. And at this point, the only guy that we know is dead was sitting right behind me. We don't know if anybody survived the helicopter crashes mm -hmm. at this point. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. But we know that the guy that was killed in action, the only one killed in action, was inches away from me. And my first thoughts were on my men. God, I don't want to lose anybody else tonight. I don't want to make a mistake and have to live with the responsibility of my failure cost a buddy their life. If the enemy, uh, you know, kills me or kills them, there's nothing I can do about that. But don't let me mess up and cost one of my men their life. And secondly, I was thinking about my family. So I married my high school sweetheart. <clears throat> we had been married for a couple of years before going to Somalia. And we had been trying to uh, all along to have a child. And 
she got pregnant right before I left for Somalia. I didn't know she was pregnant until I got there and got a letter in the mail. And so now I'm uh, thinking about rolling in the city streets and I'm not just thinking about leaving my wife a widow, but I'm thinking about a baby who will never even see their father. And that weighed really heavy on me. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, yeah. I mean, at this moment, I went to, I started to pray. This is not an exaggeration to say the most terrifying moments of my life. There isn't even a close second was standing at the back of that Humvee and washing out all of that blood, getting ready to roll out into the city streets a second time. And as I was praying, I, I didn't beg God. I didn't negotiate with God. I just simply said, God, I'm in trouble. God, I need your help. And man, he brought back this moment that I had been reading in the Bible. Now, I got up early in the morning and spent some time reading the Bible before I got my men up and we started working out and got ready for the day. Um, and a few few weeks before this, I had been reading the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as I was at the back of that Humvee and starting to think, God, I don't want to go out in the city streets again. God, I know I'm going to die. I started thinking about Jesus. And he's praying basically, Father, I don't want to go do this tonight. I know I'm going to die. I don't want this to happen to me. And that prayer that he uttered in the Garden of Gethsemane started going through my mind. If there's any way possible, let this pass from me. And at the back of that Humvee, I was praying, God, if there's any way possible, let this pass from me. And then, Michael, to, to be honest, man, the, the, this is the moment that it started to really sink in mm -hmm. what the, the significance of what he said next. Because when Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done, he knows exactly what he's going to go through, and he willingly does it so that you and I can be made free from our sin. And at the back of that Humvee, man, I prayed, God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to die tonight, but not my will. Your will be done. And if that costs, that means tonight's my last night, so be it. And when I uttered that prayer, I can't even explain this. I don't even have the right words to explain mm -hmm. it. But at that moment, man, this huge sense of peace came over me. And I think when guys hear my story, they think, oh, Jeff got shot at and he found Jesus when he was getting shot at. And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, 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 you got it all wrong. I found Jesus a long time before I got shot at. And Jesus met me at the back of that Humvee and he gave me this huge sense of peace. And the peace that I had was, yep, tonight you're probably going to die, but you don't have to worry about what happens to you after that, because tonight you're going to be with me in heaven, because eternity is waiting for you. And from that moment forward, man, I, I literally rolled back out in the city streets over and over again with this total sense of peace of knowing I'm going to die in the next few moments, but I'm not at all worried because I know what happens next. And I fought different because of that. Like I was able to do things on the battlefield because I, I know where I'm going to spend eternity. So tonight's the night. Here it comes. And, and that's basically what was going through my mind the whole 18 hours. I really was shocked the next morning when I when I pulled back in with the Humvees and thought, God, I can't believe that I survived. Like I, I thought tonight was the night. I can't believe that I made it out of there alive and made it out of there without a scratch. And a lot of the guys you were talking to, uh, I, I think they they saw that, right? They sensed that. I mean, it's just kind of a different kind of vibe, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's just this calm. And um, I mean, some people can trick themselves and lie to themselves and by sheer willpower, I'm not going to die tonight. And it's kind of like, you know, they talked about MacArthur, how he used to go up and down the trenches and yeah. be shot at, you know, with his purple scarf and, you know, but it was all about him. And is that hubris? But in your right. situation, it's your release of your own self, your own ego, your your consciousness to God, your will and say, whatever happens, happens. And that's where you were at, right? Yeah, man, you, you got the perfect show because the whole premise for fighting monsters is you got to be able to get up and to face the dark, not knowing what's in the dark. And it's just getting up and facing the dark and whatever the dark throws at you next, that is the biggest step. The first step is always the biggest step. After that, you just roll with the punches. 
Well, I roll back out in the city streets and I'm thinking, God, I know I'm going to die and I'm scared and I'm freaking out right now. And he basically reminds me, Jeff, I'm with you. And I've uh, and I, and eternity is settled once and for all. And just like you said, man, the next morning when when I got back to the base, I wasn't expecting this, but my buddies were lined up waiting for me. And they basically said, man, I listened to you over the radio last night, Jeff. And when every other voice was totally terrified, you were completely calm. Some of my buddies were saying, Jeff, I watched you in the streets, man, and you were totally calm. How is that even possible? Because you and I have the same training. And a number of my friends said, hey, man, you got something. I don't even know what it is, but I know whatever it is, I want that. So how can I have what you got? And for me, Somalia was a like a life-changing event, but it wasn't the battle. It was the next morning. Because that was the moment where I really felt God leading me into the ministry. I'd never considered it for a second before this. And after the battle was over with, it was just overwhelmingly clear. He wanted me to do something different um, and wanted me in, in to serve warriors and to reach their reach them with the gospel. Yeah, it's, it's very powerful. And I mean, if we are talking about a movie or a book or something, there are so many themes there and it's so complex. You know, you're talking about love. Uh, you're talking about sacrifice, right? You're talking about uh, courage. You're talking about good versus evil. We're talking about death or perseverance and all these themes and, and even coming of age, right? And so yeah. this is something so powerful. It, it's, it's reasoning versus faith. And so you came away with something. And so that message was what? Was it love? Out of all this complexity, yeah. you, you pulled out, what is it? It's brotherhood, yeah, man, love? I mean, ultimately, I, I've been sharing that story for 30 years almost now. And what I tell people is guys don't rush across the street and go charge a machine gun nest knowing that they're going to die. They don't do it for the American flag yeah. and they don't do it for awards. They do it because they love their buddies. That's the mm -hmm. only thing that motivates a guy or a gal to do those kind of feats of valor on the battlefield. And I, I roll back out in the city streets because I love my brothers in arms and I want to do whatever I can to help them, even if it costs me my life. Nothing else is a powerful enough motivator. Um, but I also want people to hear, look, man, I don't have this superhuman faith. I, mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus just met me in the middle of my greatest challenges and gave me a sense of peace. And the monster that all of us have to face are mm -hmm. fear. And the king of all fears is the fear of death, right? Like nobody cheats on this test and all of us have to wrestle with that one. And Jesus says, you don't even have to go through that one alone, man. I'll be right there with you. I will walk with you in the valley of the shadow of death. So I really do believe that he gives us the strength to fight any monster. Absolutely. I mean, you, you described a scene and I think it was the Pakistanis and the, um, the Malaysians and these white APCs, right. With the, yeah. you know, United Nations United blue Nations circle on it yeah. and um, uh, the blue letters. And you said there wasn't enough room for all the bodies. So you stacked all the dead bodies on top and you put the wounded inside the APCs. Right. And so as it rolled, now these vehicles are white and the blood is just coming down. Now, if just hearing me describe that, it's, it's, it's incredible. And it must have been so impactful to you guys. I'd say for a lot of people, they go through an experience and they, they get in a car accident or they get robbed or whatever it may be. And they say never again. They learn a lesson. And I think for you, you learned something um, very, uh, you know, life changing. Yeah. And I suppose because you had Christ in your in your back seat, it was something that really spoke to you. Some people never learn. Um, do you? How did you learn? I mean, do you think it was God had called you? For this day to learn, to speak to others, I mean, it, you feel that it was yeah, uh, man. fate? I mean, I'm a guy sense. who who studied war. I'm mm -hmm. a guy who trained my entire adult life for this moment. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a guy who realizes you can get so overwhelmed by the circumstances and by the enemy, no amount of training is going to get you through that. And when that happened for me in Somalia, there's only one thing left to, to rely on. Yeah. I'm not trying to be trite with this Bible mm -hmm. story, but I think Jesus sets his people up with this one. He's like, listen, man, there are people that build their life on the sand and then life gets really, really hard and the winds blow and the waves crash against it and it all comes tumbling down around you. But if you build your life on me, no matter how bad the winds howl, no matter how hard the waves smash in, you're going to be okay because you built on the solid foundation. 
And I, my faith was the solid foundation. So when the bullets and the rock, uh, rocket propelled grenades were going off all around me, I had a really solid foundation underneath me. And I don't, I can't take any credit for that. Man, I want audiences to hear. I did not do anything better than the guy who ended up in Arlington National Cemetery. Now, do you keep engaged with the guys that you serve with? I'm sure you do, but oh, yeah, all the man. time. We yeah. stay in touch, especially around the anniversary. And I don't mean mm -hmm. just reunion time, but we let each other know like, hey, brother, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you and the, the sacrifice that you made. And we remember we try not to ever forget um, the guys that gave their life on that day. So, yeah, we yeah. stay in touch. Yeah. In 2013, I think you went back, right? 20 years after. Yeah. And um, I, I want to know what you were thinking at, because, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the advisor, he said, we don't want to go in this area. And you said, well, <laughs> you said to your, your friend, you said, hey, if you're going to go, I'm going to go. And so I think it was a car district or somewhere you guys went right. in. What, what were you thinking? Well, you and my wife both want to know what was I thinking? Because yeah. when I came back, she was like, what were you thinking, man? Why would you do that? Um, the truth is my buddy Kenny and I went over there together and Kenny was on the helicopters. I was on the Humvees. Kenny and I are very close. And Kenny said, Jeff, I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. and Jeff, I need to go back and I need you to go with me. And I said, Kenny, are you crazy? This <laughs> is the most dangerous city on earth. I still know the intelligence reports. Yeah. Nothing is worse than Somalia. And he's like, yeah, I know that, but I need to go and I need you to go with me. And you know the deal, Michael, man, that that bond that we forged together in the military was stronger than blood. And I said, Kenny, if you really need to go, then, yeah, I'll go. Um, and when we got in Somalia, he said, I need to go back to the very spot where this thing happened. And I was like, OK, but everybody is saying that's the bad guy town. Even the Somali army said, we don't go in there. We just let yeah. them do whatever they want. And like the documentary shows when we returned to Mogadishu, uh, we got we were doing this little convoy. And Kenny said, Jeff, do you think we can get in there? And I was like, well, let's give it a shot. But we're probably both going to get killed going back. <laughs> there. If you need to do this. I'll do it with you. But we're probably both going to die doing this. Um, and God was gracious. And obviously I survived. Spoiler alert. Kenny and I both survived. So did he get closure? I mean, what you know, some people go somewhere and they never get that answer that they're they're looking for. That yeah, that um, thing that shuts that door forever for them. I think no and yes. He mm -hmm. did not see the spot on the ground where it all went down, and that's really what he wanted to see. But yes, getting there and taking in from a distance, being able to stand back from a distance and kind of observe what happened. I think when we got back, he and I both shook our heads and said, "How how is it possible?" that he got out of there alive, that I got out of there alive 20 years ago. Now looking at it 20 years later, how is it possible that that even happened? And I think that might have been the closure that he and I were both looking for. Now you did something pretty incredible, and that is um, you, you produced quite a bit in your lifetime, became a pastor, you're a very notable speaker, very articulate, et cetera. Failure. A lot of people come out of a situation and, and they, you know, um, have a rough go. Um, did you have a rough go for a couple of years when you separated, when you left? I mean, did you have regret that you were leaving and you spent, I think 23 something years. Did you have regret or loss or something that you tried I, to fathom? I struggled a okay. lot after I left the military. I didn't really struggle with Somalia or Iraq or Afghanistan or Panama or Kuwait. I struggled with leaving the military and I didn't think that I would. I thought, Oh, it'll be easy. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to take the uniform off. And then I took the uniform off and I started just, and I struggled really bad for a long time. To be honest, I still struggle a little bit. And it's occurred to me, it took me a while to figure this out. But what uh, I think my greatest struggle is I really did have the honor of working with some of the greatest men and women on the planet. Mm -hmm. And they were around me all day long. I had a privilege of working with my heroes. And then after I left the military, Let's just be honest, the guys and gals that I was around all day long were not like these warriors. And probably what I struggle with more than anything else was just uh, the, the amazing people that I worked with in the military and how different life is outside of the military. And I, I think I still struggle with that a little bit. So let's talk about that, man. You, you have the unbeatable army. So 
what is the unbeatable army? Is that helping people cope with what, bring me up to speed, what yeah, you're doing yeah. now and, and what is that? Sure. The unbeatable army is just a group of people that are staying connected to one another that are helping each other get through life's hardest moments. Mm -hmm. So about nine months ago or so, I launched a podcast called unbeatable. This isn't a plug for this podcast, but what I realized is, man, because of my story, I've had the honor of speaking with some incredible people that have gone through amazing circumstances, and they kind of pour the whole thing out to me just when we're talking. And I thought, man, I want the world to hear what these people have gone through. So I started interviewing them, launched this podcast, and then invited people to get connected, what we call the unbeatable army. Um, and the unbeatable army is just helping ordinary people go through extraordinary circumstances. And I tell people, look, if I can do it, if the guests that you're hearing on this podcast can do it, then you can too, but you're going to need something to stand on. And that's something, or let's just put it this way. Someone mm -hmm. is the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Now you've got your book, the road to unafraid. How did that come out what where did you get the prompting to do that is yeah. that something that you had to get off your chest or did a publisher come and say hey we need a book what, what was that um it was definitely a publisher mm -hmm. uh, the movie black hawk down came out while i was still on active duty and i started to get thousands and thousands of requests to go speak around the world and because i'm still on active duty and by the way the u.s is at war and i'm going to afghanistan and iraq a lot i had to turn almost all of the requests down so finally, a couple, not one, but a couple of publishers came to me and said, you really need to put this in a book because you're never going to be able to go to all of these audiences. Even if you weren't in the army, you couldn't go to all of these requests. Mm -hmm. So um, I blew it off for a couple of years. Literally, I was like, man, I'm busy. I got a, I got other stuff to focus on. But then finally, a publishing company said, listen, man, we'll give you a co-author. They'll help you write your story and get it in print. You just got to get the story out. And that's really how the book, The Road to Unafraid, happened. And by the way, Dean Merrill wrote the book. He just I, I gave him the story. He put it on paper. So if you like it, it's because Dean did a great job. If you hate it, it's because of me. The story. <laughs> Well, look, you're doing a lot. And we talk about we fight monsters. What monsters do most men fight? Does it, is it uh, feeling, uh, you know, a lack of purpose or insecure about themselves, shame? What, what, what prevents men from getting ahead? I mean, you went through a crisis moment where you changed. You shifted your, your paradigm. What, what do men need to do to get to that yeah, place man. where you are today? Um, I have this burning passion to help men because mm -hmm. the society that we live in is stacked against you. And the reason why it's stacked against you is nobody has the um, nobody gives a man this goal to live up to and tells him this is the point where you become a man. So you have 25, 35, 55 year old boys still trying to figure out what does it mean to be a man? And I want to see America just full of strong, passionate, noble, good men. But for the most part, dads didn't hand this off to their sons. And let's just be honest, that's not what the nightly news or what the popular media is portraying. What they show of a man is a, a guy who's a loser or who is, you know, his life has fallen apart. And so I'm just trying to help raise the bar for manhood in America and say what every wife, what every child in America needs is a great husband or a mm -hmm. good daddy. What every son needs is the kind of daddy who he says, I'm gonna be like my dad one day. What every daughter needs is the kind of daddy who she can say, I'm gonna marry a man exactly like my daddy one day. And many guys want to be that kind of guy, they just don't know how. So yeah, I mean, a, a lot of- lay a, lay a vision in front of them. That's part of what I try to do. Yeah, a lot of the comedies out there, like uh, Everybody Loves Raymond or whatever, it's always ripping the guy apart, and he's just a loser and a bum, and he's just he wants to come home from work and watch TV all day and drink beers, and it's uh, it, it you know it's comedy, but at some point it um, seeps so much into the culture that uh, we forget, you know, how vital men are needed in our society. Yeah. You know, they should have rites of passage. You know, in some cultures, it's a bar mitzvah, right? You know, a, right. a boy's man at thirteen. In some African cultures, they become a man at eight, and so yeah. they go on a long walk or they hunt a lion or whatever right. it may be. The Maasai warriors. 
And so it's lost upon us here. We forget some of our rights, our, 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 uh, our creeds and some of those things that really make us what we need to be. And it looks like you're doing it. So <clears throat> it's easy to see the movie. And, and weep, honestly, it is. And, and, and I don't have to be there. Uh, what is that common thread that's uniting? Is it humanity? Why is it that I can weep? Or why can any man weep? Is it your situation that you're in that we relate to that? Uh, is it the idea of death or loss or or our, our lack of immortality? What is it? Hey, man, I'm going to say this, and it's not meant to be a, a, a trite statement, but... Mm -hmm. It takes a powerful man to be willing to show and his emotions. Mm -hmm. And what most American men have heard is boys don't cry. Well, that's just absolutely crap. Yeah. So my wife and I have three sons and then two daughters. And for mm -hmm. each one of our sons, I looked him in the eyes and said, when you're man enough, you will be comfortable with your emotions and able to show them in public, which means when it's sad and you feel like crying, cry. When it's bad and you get angry, get angry. Don't run from your emotions. Don't hide your emotions. It's what makes a bold, a uh, good man, a bold, good man. But the 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 humanity in not just Black Hawk Down, but anytime mm -hmm. you see that kind of violence, that that kind of killing, um, it's supposed to tug at your heart a little bit. But what really tugs at your heart is to watch the kind of sacrifice that yes. one guy will make for the other that's the thing that should cause audiences to sit back and to just say wow what i'm seeing is absolutely beautiful and it, you know it's only in the worst of circumstances that you see that kind of humanity come out absolutely you know uh it, it seems that so many men are united in some type of brotherhood upon some unforeseen situation or circumstance and that it seems a lot of men are waiting for that to happen for them to feel a connection with anyone how can we as men or as christians feel a connection to society it seems like men are so aloof or they're so disconnected uh, they're on the fringe of that you know they're that 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 the venn diagram of you know me and culture and society and all that how can we feel more connected without having to go through a combat experience, without having to kill someone, without having to do whatever? What yeah. would you say? That's the question that really needs to be discussed. Okay. Because in America, the average guy has a thousand Facebook followers or Facebook friends, a thousand casual acquaintances, but they don't have one real no kidding brother that they can just pour their soul out to. Yeah. yeah. They got a couple of friends that they know I could call them on the phone and they'll come bail me out of jail, but they don't have one guy that they can really pour their soul out to. Mm -hmm. And my challenge for guys is everybody needs that guy. In fact, you need him right now tonight because you need that kind of brotherhood before you go into battle. I call a buddy like that. Uh, <laughs> I have a friend that calls a buddy like that. They're kind of like a, a guardrail on a dangerous mountain road. They're going to let you crash against them before they let you go flying off the side of this cliff and, and turn into a fiery ball. Well, you don't develop those kind of relationships when the chips are down. They, you have to have already built them before times get bad. So what I'm challenging is if you don't have that kind, if you're listening to this episode and you don't have that kind of buddy tonight, you need to go out and find it. And I'll tell you, you have to become that kind of buddy before you're going to find that kind of buddy. So go find a dude who you say, I'm going to open up and bear my soul to you. I'm going to be there for you no matter what happens. And I need you to bear your soul to me. And I need you to be there for me no matter what happens. And that buddy may save your marriage. He may save your business because he prevents you from doing something really stupid. He may save your life. He may be the reason why you don't put a pistol in your mouth and mm -hmm. just end it all tonight. You need that kind of buddy and you need him before times get bad. I'd agree. It seems like in movies, you know, when we're going to share, it's we just laugh and laugh and it's so silly. You're going to share your feelings. And I don't think that we spend enough time in our common culture to give uh a love for another man, the yeah. reverence that it deserves, it deserves the, the sacredness that it deserves it. it everything is ridiculed. It's, it's derision. It's, uh, you know, silly. And just to be serious and say, I need help or, uh, you know, yeah. I'm struggling or I'm hurting. And, and how do I get through this? Um, 
Yeah, can I, if I can interrupt? Yeah, please. There, uh, there's a beautiful, powerful example of this in the Bible. When you have two of the greatest warriors probably in the nation that connect with one another at the deepest levels, it is Jonathan, the son of the king, who himself is a warrior and already climbed up the side of the cliffs and started a fight on his own. And David, who's picked a fight with Goliath and won. Yeah. And these two warriors come together and Jonathan and David, the Bible says they loved each other with a love stronger than a man's love for a woman. I don't think there's anything sexual about that. Not at They're all. Saying, these two warriors respected each other. They, they were there for each other. And when David needed somebody, Jonathan was there for him. And when Jonathan needed somebody, David was there for them. And I'm just saying every guy watching this episode tonight needs a David Jonathan kind of you need a dude in your life like David and Jonathan needed. One dude, just one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you've had a very good career. And and so asking, I think you'd say, you know, it's God has helped me through all of it. But let me ask you differently. What's the one trait do you think a man should have to get him to, you know, uh, some point in his career or some point in life where he can say, I, I was successful. What What does that man need? The most powerful uh, character trait mm -hmm. of, the, of the greatest men that I know is humility. And I'm not um, being light with this statement. I mean, humble enough to fall down on their knees and to say, I screwed up. Or humble enough to reach out and to say, I'm in over my head and I need help. Humble enough to not try to figure it all out or fix it all themselves but to reach out for help. And the guy who's humble enough to reach out for help is will find help when they need it and powerful enough to get through the biggest problems because they don't go through it on their own. It's a moron who thinks I can handle <laughs> whatever life is going to throw at right. me all by myself. No, you can't. I, I don't know any man on the planet that can handle that. And you can't handle it either because I can't handle it. Right. How about heroes? Anyone that you'd uh, like to have coffee with? I mean, uh, not a modern day hero today, but yeah. someone from the past, you know, would I've it be got, someone like uh, Churchill list, or T. Lawrence? A list about this long of heroes. I have some yeah. political heroes that I would love to. Churchill is my favorite politician okay. of all times. Um, one of the historical American history figures that I would love to spend one afternoon with is Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. Just because of the way Roosevelt approached life. But of course, my hero bore uh, a cross and was a tougher man than anybody that I've ever heard of or read about. And that, of course, is King Jesus. And um, yeah. I get the honor of spending time with him every day. So I get a chance to hang out with my hero among heroes. I agree. It's a wonderful hero. Well, let me let me talk about um, what are you doing currently? Where, where can we find you? Uh, you're doing uh, Two Cities Church or did yeah. I get that wrong? So you nailed it. Okay. So you're doing that right now. Are you writing any more books or any yeah, more books coming out? A book right now. Um, how about, about halfway through, got a friend of mine who's helping me because I'm not smart enough to write a book and I'm <laughs> working with it. I can't do this on my own. I need help. Um, so I'm working on a book right now for leaders about how to build culture. Um, I won't spoil it, but it's mm -hmm. about halfway done. And I'm trying to tell people there is a way to create bulletproof culture. And I think I've had a chance to see it. And maybe I can help you create a bulletproof culture in your organization, whatever that is. Um, my real passion is to introduce men to Jesus. So sure. I have the privilege of leading Two Cities Church, which is right outside of Fort Benning, Georgia, and some of the greatest men on the planet, Marines, sailors, airmen, and of course, soldiers pass through Fort Benning. And what a privilege to be able to meet with them, minister to them, and maybe introduce them to Christ. And then of course, you've got the Unbeatable Army. Um, yeah. This podcast <laughs> that I'm leaving. You probably get so many people, so many guys come up to you and ask you a question. What, what, what's the most common question they ask you? I mean, you, you give so many leadership classes. Three of them, and I yeah. can tell you 10,000 times I've been asked these three questions. Okay, go for it. Um, number one, by a landslide, is, is it okay for a Christian to kill in combat? It's okay. almost always warriors that ask that question, but they're asking me because they know my faith and they know about Black Hawk Down. Number two, they say, hey, how do you live out your Christian faith in a very pagan, very wicked, very sinful environment? Mm -hmm. And all of us uh, have that kind of environment around us to some degree. Number three, and this is probably where every guy listening to this episode lives, is how do I do good at work 
and also honor my family. Like the tug between work and home, how do you do that, man? And every one of those are hard. Um, there's no quick, easy answer to either, any of those. But if you're asking that question or questions like that, it tells me your heart is in the right place. Um, because if you weren't even thinking in these lines, you're probably already off track and you don't even know it. Jeff, it's been great talking to you, man. I, I know we could talk a lot more, but, uh, you know, the attention span of a lot of listeners is very tight, but I would love sure. to have you back on. Um, and yeah. so, listen, don't go anywhere. Um, guys, please. Uh, you know, Jeff, so where can they find you? They can find you at um, your website, right? And what is the yeah, website? I mean, the best way to find me is go to jeffstrucker.com. Right. And then also you're on Instagram as well. And they can look it up. Great. So, guys, please like, subscribe, share. Check out what Jeff is doing. He's doing some amazing stuff. You watch the video, but don't just watch Black Hawk Down the movie. Watch his interviews on YouTube with so many other. He's doing other other podcasts. It's fantastic. Um, just to get a taste of what he's talking about. This is a man to me as a Christian myself. I, I think he's living it and he's out there trying to change the culture, trying to change people and and using some very painful, hurtful experiences to try to connect with other men and change the world. And that's that's commendable. So, um, Jeff, don't go anywhere. We'll talk offline. Guys, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Had some questions, um, but uh, we'll get, that, get to that next time. Again, thank you for watching We Fight Monsters. God bless you and never give up.